Good afternoon. Welcome to this very special FE Week virtual roundtable. Um, if we've not met before, my name is Shane Chowen and I'm the editor at FE Week. Today, with the support of our friends at NCFE, we've got a really big topic to talk about. And it's one that's really at the very heart of decision making in the further education and skills sector. And that question, put simply, is this. Does the FE and skill system currently have the right balance between meeting the needs of employers and meeting the needs of learners and local communities? Joining us from NCFE today is CEO David Gallagher. David, thanks for helping us put this roundtable together. Hello, Shane. Yeah, really delighted to, to be able to sponsor this incredibly important conversation. You know, we're at a point where the, the world uh, seems quite crazy at the moment and upside down. So hopefully through this conversation, we can you know, make some sense of what's going on in our part of the world in education and uh, really looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, it should be a good one. And as you say, it comes at a really um, pivotal moment in the sector and in society and in our economy, which, as we all know, is going through some difficult times at the moment. So let me just briefly set the scene for the discussion and then we'll introduce uh, our participants in today's roundtable. Um, so as we uh, all know, the government's flagship white paper, Skills for Jobs, is now just over 18 months old. So it's, uh, it's got legs, it's walking, it's babbling, it's talking, it's starting to grow up, starting to materialise into something real. We can start to see some of the changes. Now, the very first line of that white paper said that its aim was to strengthen the links between employers and further education providers. And since then, new laws have been passed in Parliament that make the way for those measures to become a reality. So the white paper and the Skills and Post-16 Post Education Act that followed both included lots of new policies which really cement the government's ambition, uh, probably decade plus long drive towards a skill system which is led by employers. So what does that all mean? Well, we've now got a skill system where the leadership role of employers is literally written into the law of the land. There are local groups of employers that can now get recognised by the government as official employer representative bodies, and their job is to write local skills improvement plans which describe what employers need in a local area. And providers, in particular colleges, will also be held to account through things like Ofsted inspections um, and a new accountability dashboard against the extent to which they're meeting the needs of employers against those local skills plans. So there are even more, and there are even more powers that the government have given themselves to step in and intervene if a college is deemed not to be meeting those skills needs of local employers. And that's without even talking about all the other ways that employers shape the FE and skill system, whether that's on policy, on curriculum, funding through the apprenticeship levy, on assessment, on qualifications, even providing equipment for learners and uh, teachers to use in the classroom and in workshops. So then you've got assessment, you've got work experience, industry placements, the list goes on and on. So over at the Department for Education, they've created a new unit for future skills, which is uh, a fairly new innovation, and that replaces a skills and productivity board as the source of information and employer intelligence around skills needs. On a local level, we've had local enterprise partnerships, skills advisory panels, which both seem to have been usurped by these new employer representative bodies. And all of this at a time when the number of adults in education and training itself is half what it was 10 years ago. So a lot of change, but will any of it really make a difference? That's what we're gonna talk about today is too much control now in the hands of employers. How much control do employers really want anyway? And what have been the consequences of this employer-led system? Does it benefit some learners over others? And if so, who is getting left behind? So here to discuss today's big question is a big panel with big brains. Uh, Robert West is Head of Education and Skills at the CBI. Hi there, Robert. Hello, how are you doing? Good to have you with us. Um, Stephen Evans is Chief Executive at Learning and Work Institute. Hi, Stephen. Hi, Shane. Afternoon. Afternoon. Uh, Jennifer Coupland is Chief Executive at the Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education. Hi, Jennifer. Hi. Uh, Neil Bentley is Chief Exec at World Skills UK. Hi, Neil. Hi, Shane. Hi, everybody. Simon Ashworth is Policy Director at the Association of Employment and Learning Providers. Hi, Simon. Hi, Shane. Hi, everybody. And Ollie Newton is Executive Director at the Edge Foundation. Hi, Ollie. Hi, uh, great to be with you. Great. What an amazing lineup. So let's get right to it. I've asked each of our uh, participants today to spend between two and three minutes really giving their overall views, their opening gambit, if you like, on today's 
theme. So let's go in the order in which I introduced them um, today. So Robert, let's come to you first. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, well, from the CBI perspective, it's worth outlining perhaps first of all that the CBI is a membership organization of 190,000 businesses. Within those businesses, they employ people uh, with technical education qualifications from level two to level seven. And we also cover delivery as well. Uh, we have provider members. So we've got quite a wide uh, gambit and a wide church to be involved in that. And I think that's quite important because in relation to the needs of uh, learners and local communities, uh, one of our key points is that you actually need a balance of employers and local communities and government to be uh, truly creating an effective skill system. Uh, and an effective skill system is really what you need to spread opportunity across the, the UK as well. Uh, you use the term, as, as is often used now, about things being led by employers and interestingly place that question of how much control do employers want. I think our view is that what employers want is uh, a, a, the system to be responsive to employers, but not necessarily determined by employers as well. I don't think the whole gambit of employers and small businesses, all up to very large, have the time or resources to get into some of the detail that we're talking about. And sometimes that's the barrier for some of uh, the businesses to get involved in technical education. They would say to us, we simply haven't got the time to do that. We haven't got the resources to do that. So how can we do that? But as I say, our We've been calling for some time now for a high quality technical route that matches academic uh, qualifications as well. So things like the T-level is uh, something that we would support in principle. Similarly, with, with LSEPs and, uh, as you say, employee representative boards, the principle of it is something we, we uh, support very much. But all these things depend on who's around the table anyway. So just taking things like uh, local skills improvement plans, you've got to have more than just the usual suspects around there to get a true picture of what's needed. And that goes straight in for me about taking on board the needs of learners and local communities, as well as businesses that are of all sizes and all groups, really. So as I say, I think our opening gamut is a very simple answer. Should, should they carry equal weight into the needs of employers? Yes, yes, they should. And I don't know of many employers that would argue uh, against that. I think, as I say, employers would meet, understand the meaning of led by employers to mean responsive to the needs of employers. But of course, you have to be responsive to, to local um, skills as well. But, uh, an employment system and a skill system that's brought into by everyone is what's crucial really. And I think the only other thing we, I'd add is that we need a stable system as well. A lot of people are caught out by a very fragmented skill system at the moment, uh, one that tries to do lots of things and tends to change quite quickly. Um, and a lot of employers don't necessarily understand what an LSEP is, how that's different from some of the things that have gone before that you mentioned as well. So there's an appetite for employers to be involved, but I think the message we would say from the CBI is we're not seeing any desire from employers to say it should all be about us. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's the cause at all. These things will work when they work in, in harmony and partnership of business, education and government working together. Fantastic, Robert. Thank you very much. Um, I think we may well see some themes emerge from your opening gambit there around things like stability, um, but we'll see. Um, Stephen, over to you. Thanks, Shane. Yes, I think there might be lots of agreement between us, but possibly for slightly different reasons. So it'd be interesting to, to tease some of that out. I mean, I, I think um, if you look at um, um, overall employer investment in skills, it's down 28% since the mid 2000s. And you're three times more likely to get training at work if you've got a degree um, than if you've got no qualifications at all. So there's this slight mismatch here. Um, and when I was in government, we were saying, well, actually, yes, we need systems to be employer led, but actually there are market failures here and there are uh, bigger things that we need to look at as well, like how do we get to net zero and, and how can skills support um, 
help with some of that. So I think if you have a purely employer-led system, what you end up with is the picture we've got now, which is to, to those who have the most qualifications will go more training. Um, and we see a 63% fall in adults doing uh, basic skills training, for example. So you can't have a purely employer-led system in that sort of um, way because there are market failures and there are bigger public policy priorities. Also, because there's more to life than work. I know kind of this is controversial. I'm sure amongst all of us around this table as we get ready to go and enjoy the sunshine a bit later. But there is more to life than work. And learning isn't just about work, despite what the um, first line of the uh, uh, white paper might, might have said. So learning has all kinds of benefits for health, for well-being, for civic engagement. And that's not just about employers. So we shouldn't forget that wider purpose of learning. And then also, um, what about people needing to retrain? So that's not about their current employer, it's about a different future employer. Um, so there's, there's, there's all these sorts of competing priorities, there's all these different things that are all really um, important and an employer-led system on its own doesn't quite get you there. I guess the last point I'd make um, is that I, I'm, not sure there'd be, I'm not sure there'd be that many employers who would necessarily agree we've got an employer-led skill system now um, and I, slight, I I don't quite share uh, Robert's optimism about um, uh, LSIPs, which are the, the latest acronym off the block. Um, you know, we've kind of, governments for decades have been arguing for employer-led skill systems. We've had various, various acronyms have, have uh, come and gone, Unit for Future Skills, you know, we've kind of had uh, Manpower Services Commissions, UK Commission, all these, all these sorts of things. The question is what's going to be different now? Um, I slightly worry we're very proud at learning the lessons of history um, and I also worry philosophically that we're getting lots of people, a self-selecting group, to write plans and then colleges will have to write about how they're uh, taking account of those plans. I'd much rather put more money, more power, more control in the hands of individual employers and individuals rather than have lots of planning where the ultimate lead is really the Department for Education. So happy to explore that a bit more and look forward to the rest of the discussion. Really nice, interesting idea that you left us on there, Stephen. Um, thank you very much. Um, now, we've just been joined by um, Diamond Fury, who is an academic mentor at uh, George Green's school. Um, Diamond, can you hear us all right? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. So what we'll do is we'll just carry on going around the panel and then um, let you settle in um, and come back to you um, in a second. So... Um, if you wouldn't mind just muting your microphone until we've got round to you, um, that would be fantastic. Um, we're going to move on now to um, Jennifer from the Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education. Um, Jennifer, your three minute opening gambit. Uh, thanks, Shane. So um, I think the original question was around whether we should have learners and local communities having equal weighting to the needs of employers if we're serious about levelling up. Um, so, so just trying to sort of draw on that and the, the comments of the previous two speakers. Um, you know, IFATE, as you know, is, is uh, an organisation that was set up um, in the wake of the uh, 2012 Richard Review of Apprenticeships. And we've, we've been very much uh, uh, injected into the landscape, into the skills landscape, if you like, to enable employers to, to lead uh, on, on the skills agenda. Uh, I was delighted, I think, with Shane, with your your sort of tour through all the ways that employers are engaged uh, in the system uh, in all sorts of different ways and in all, all sorts of different levels. But I think from our perspective, um, the really critical thing that employers have been doing over the last 10 years um, in their thousands uh, is working with with us to um, set the standards that they expect for uh, for training, both for apprentices uh, and now into the sort of technical qualification space. And I think that is a really critical role where employers really are best to lead um, because they are the people that at the end of the day will be employing. Uh, people who've finished their apprenticeship or they've finished their uh, technical qualification. And if we have employers um, in the driving seat of setting out, you know, what's the knowledge that you need for the job? What are the skills you need for the job? What are the behaviours that you need to be able to demonstrate? I think that really helps the whole levelling up agenda because it means anyone training on those products can be confident that they're getting the skills that those employers have said that they need. Um, and I think it's also important to sort of 
do a bit of a look back, you know, to the to the system that we had uh, before we've uh, started to build our, our kind of employer led system. Um, you know, we did have more um, young apprentices, for example, and there's been quite a lot of debate about whether that's, a, you know, uh, how big a problem it is and what do we do about trying to grow the numbers of young apprentices. Uh, and we had more SMEs um, taking on apprentices in, in the old system. Um, but we also had lots of people who were undertaking really poor quality training uh, in low skill, low pay jobs. Uh, and I think that is a real crime. Uh, and I think that's something that the employer led reforms are, are driving out of the system. Um, because, you know, we've got employers investing their own money directly into apprenticeships. You know, we've seen as a result of the uh, apprenticeship levy, a doubling uh, of uh, uh, investment in uh, in apprenticeships. Um, but I do take Stephen's point uh, earlier that, you know, overall, we've seen a reduction in, in the investment in uh, in skills. And I think we are very keen at IFATE to, to be clear that, you know, apprenticeships shouldn't be the only show uh, uh, in town in the skills world. You know, we need to have different products and we need to have employers investing in other ways uh, in skills training, not just through the apprenticeship levy. Uh, and we need to have other, other other products for people at different levels and stages of, of their careers as well. Um, so I think, you know, we want a system where employers are leading in terms of the setting of standards. Um, and I think when you look at our competitor nations, I mean, Germany is always the example people go to, there is a much, much better blend between the education sector and, and employment in terms of the availability of work placements and uh, extended periods of, of, of time spent in industry. And that's really part of the culture of, of, of the country that I think we're really hankering after. We would love we would love to get to a position where all employers just assume that it was part and parcel of what you did to take young people into your organisation and, and to support them with their training while they were at college or, or doing a, an apprenticeship. And we're not quite there yet. Um, but saying all of that and saying that we need, you know, kind of employers leading on setting standards is not to say that we don't think it's important to really, really listen and act on the feedback that we get from apprentices and, and from, um, from people in the regions. IFAKE cares deeply about the needs of apprentices and other learners. Two years ago, we set up our own uh, apprenticeship panel. They're fantastic. Um, uh, we've got representatives from, from across all sectors of, of the economy. Uh, they've produced their own guidance that they've written um, that's directed to employers to say to employers, you know, if you're taking on an apprentice, this is what a fabulous apprenticeship experience looks like. And this is what we think you should be doing. And we've been promoting that and we've had loads and loads of hits on, on that. Um, we're also working quite closely with the Unit for Future Skills and uh, the British Chambers of Commerce and, and all of their involvement in the local skills improvement plans to really get a sense of what uh, our role needs to be as a national standard setting organisation working with employers when it comes to what's going to work at a local level um, for local communities and smaller employers who are looking to get you know, their skills met from the sort of in the local labour market. Jennifer, thank you very much. Um, let's get the World Skills UK view now from its CEO, Neil Bentley Gockman. Hi, Neil. Over to you. Hi, Shane. Thanks very much. Um, and I guess, you know, from our perspective at World Skills UK, you know, we take a very international view um, and an outlook on, on these sorts of questions, um, given that our role is about showcasing British skills excellence abroad, but also learning from best practice internationally. And I think for a lot of our major competitor economies, particularly in, in Asia and Indo-Pacific, they wouldn't be asking this question. The question would simply be it's about the economy um, and it's about how do we meet the needs of a growing economy and in a changing economy. Um, but, I, but I don't think within, within the question, it's a kind of either or for us. It should be really you know, sort of either employers or learners. It should be more about creating a, a sort of virtuous, virtuous circle, really, by creating vibrant local economies that serves learners, employers and communities. Um, but it is, I think, right that there is an emphasis on employer needs and economic needs, a more demand led system, because we've been talking, Stephen was saying, we've been talking about this for years. And, and yet the supply uh, debate, the supply side debate, you know, it never, we never seem to get the two to really talk to each other effectively. 
So I think, you know, having an economic led narrative around the importance of skills is absolutely, you know, where we need to be taking the conversation. It's what other countries are doing. And, um, and within that, I think there is a big opportunity for the skills sector in the UK working with employers to really, you know, step up as part of a solution, as part of a driver for economic growth and development, whether it's levelling up or is there regional economic development and, and creating jobs, because economic growth, jobs, 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 that's the agenda that we're walking into and leaning into as we're facing pretty tricky economic circumstances you know, over the next couple of months. And I think there is, you know, there's a there's a massive opportunity for the skill system and, and leaders in the skill system to really step up and talk about the fantastic work they do in training young people and training, you know, retraining older people and um, to be successful in, in their working lives. You know, notwithstanding Stephen's point that it's not all about work. Um, but but actually, you know, we have a massive opportunity to create a high, a, you know, a high quality pipeline of talent. And that's really important, I think, to give employers confidence and investors confidence to invest to create the jobs we need across the regions and nations of the UK and gives learners hope and aspiration for the future wherever they live. So I think it is really about, you know, getting on to an, an economic led agenda. Um, and, you know, because when I look at what Singapore is doing and what South Korea is doing and Taiwan's doing, they're very much firmly on its skills for the economy and skills for jobs, which is the name of the white paper where, you know, you started off talking about Shane. So, you know, when I just look around at even our near neighbours, France, they've got a very sophisticated, high quality skills offer um, that really links into their economic development needs and, and to attract inward investment to create those jobs. And, you know, we are you know, trying to, to do our bit at World Skills UK and working with support, you know, from David at NCFE, creating a network of partners who are really using international best practice to drive up standards in future skills needs to meet the needs of employers and meet the needs of the economy. And so there's a massive opportunity for skills for providers, I think, to, to, to work with us on that. And, you know, this is, you know, through LSIPs. Um, and but it's not just about LSIPs in terms of the, you know, the, the role looking at today's skill shortages and, and today's employer needs. It also has to take a longer term view in conjunction with the, you know, the unit for future skills and DFE, because we do need to take a longer term view. This is what other countries are really good at. They have stable systems. They can take longer term views, looking at how the economy is developing, what investors need and what employers need and start developing the pipeline of skills to make those needs. So it's not at the expense of, lawyer, of learners or communities. It's all about them. Um, it's recognizing where the job opportunities in the future are going to come, where they'll be, and preparing from our perspective young people for those opportunities and for employment. So it's about jobs, it's about economic growth. I think that's the agenda. And I think skills leaders and skills providers have a brilliant opportunity to be more prominent and confident in the role in driving change, developing people with high quality skills uh, as the enabler to meet employer and economic need. And that's so important as well for getting on board, not just with the DFE led agenda in England, but also so we can talk to the Treasury and Bays and the Department for International Trade about a joined up skills offer. So I think there's massive opportunity in thinking, you know, reframing the question and thinking about how we all, you know, play a role in, in making a success of the, of the agenda you've set out, Shane, because it's about jobs and it's about the economy and that's going, those drivers are going to be with us in, in tricky circumstances over the next couple of years. Fantastic. Thank you, Neil. And thank you for somewhat lampooning our question there by suggesting that the, the learner and the employer sides aren't necessarily um, mutually exclusive. Um, so thanks for that, Neil. Um, Simon, we're going to come over to you next. Yeah, thanks, Shane. It's always uh, ni nice to go after a few other people so you can get a bit of a, a, bit of a, a, a theme going. Um, I always think, you know, le levelling up, sometimes people see it, as that, that see it very much as a sort of geographical challenge between the sort of nor north and south and uh, Certainly, as somebody who lives in the Midlands, you know, I always think, are we levelling up or levelling down? We kind of get left behind. But uh, certainly, from certainly from a skills perspective, you know, thinking around levelling up, the, the two the two areas for us really is around, and kind of Jennifer kind of touched on this really is certainly around apprenticeships. Um, it is around opportunities for young people. You know, we've seen seen a, seen a real decline in in young people participating in, in apprenticeships, uh, and also SME engagement in apprenticeships as well, almost to, to the extent, uh, you know, the, the growth of uh, larger employers. So it's about uh, 
uh, you know, giving those uh, individuals the opportunity to put in the ladder for, for young people into their first job or, or career, that young talent, absolutely is a, is a role for uh, reskilling uh, older individuals. But we need to think about how, how do we uh, get more talent in, into the workplace. And also for some of those smaller employees, but how do they compete and grow uh, in the economy as it expands? So certainly they're kind of key around the apprenticeships. Uh, ALP, our, our vision is very much around uh, a, a demand-led system for skills. Um, you know, so you know, think about areas like adult, uh, the adult education s- uh, system. You know, we see very much uh, giving learners more autonomy. Uh, you know, as a membership body that sort of represents training providers, you know, we we were quite bold, and we you know we saw the kind of move away from provider-led with the apprenticeship system as a, as a good thing. You know, giving employers greater choice. And we'd like to see kind of greater choice given to uh, individuals as well when it comes to the, the adult education space. Timing of this session is kind of really, really pertinent, actually, because we had the uh, National uh, Audit Office published quite a, uh, an interesting report yesterday on um, uh, workplace skills. It might have been yesterday, it might have been today. I'm losing track of t- time. But uh, some key things in there, weren't they? They talked about, um, um, you know, they kind of questioned to some extent, you know, what has been the impact of uh, an employer-led skill system? You know, has it actually made the impact that... Uh, People said it would do. Um, as Stephen mentioned, you know, the investment in, in skills by employers uh, has reduced, and participation's uh, declined as well over the last few years. So some of your kind of key 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 challenges there. Real sort of theme there is, you know, certainly when we talk to our members, you know, stability is key. We want evolution, uh, not revolution. Uh, I think one of the one of the challenges we probably need to to, to discuss further is sometimes that there could be a dichotomy between what employers want and what individuals want as well. You know, one of the things we've seen from the apprenticeship system is that you know the skills and knowledge and behaviours that uh, apprentices get through their high quality training actually makes them more portable. Uh, so actually, it's good for them because they can move around to different employers. But you know that potentially creates a risk to employers. So sometimes. I don't think we, we acknowledge enough the, the dichotomy that uh, you know, what might be good for some learners might not necessarily be good for employers and a bit of a trade-off there. And I guess sort of final thought for me, um, you know, I've been lucky that, you know, ALP have been involved in some of the, the LSIP pilots, uh, certainly the one here in the um, in Leicester, Leicestershire. Uh, one of the things that was a was a real sort of surprise, you know, there is a very different approach here looking at uh, rather than job roles, looking at uh, skills, knowledge and behaviours. Uh, and it wasn't about technical skills. You know, actually, what employers uh, have been tell- telling the ERB is very much that, uh, you know, this, they want, they just need people, you know, with good core skills, uh, resilience, timekeeping, hard work. Mass and English featured, featured significantly. I know that was a key feature from some of the other pilots as well. So actually, you know, get people in and they can build those skills, you know, once they're in that workforce. So uh, that was one of the kind of key findings for me. So, yeah, a, re- a really sort of interesting debate around uh, employer-led, demand-led. Uh, you know, ultimately, the, the, the learner in all these programmes is a service user, and, and they do get forgotten occasionally, which uh, we need to bring bring back into into scope. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Thank you, Simon. Um, and Ollie, over to you. Thanks very much. Yeah, tough gig uh, following such great uh, input from others. But um, I was just thinking one of the phrases that we use in this space is about employers being in the driving seat. And um, we had a little chuckle when we saw the Flexi Jobs Apprenticeship um, uh, consultation last year because that talked about uh, apprentices being in the driving seat. And we were thinking the driving seat is getting mighty uh, kind of crowded these days. But maybe we're talking about like a dual control when like in a little car. So we'll have to we'll have to kind of adapt that um, that metaphor. But I think it's really clear to us that looking at kind of some of the big surveys and Simon's just mentioned some some recent work there. But things like the employer perspective survey, the work that colleagues uh, at CBI and, and Robert's team have done. You know, employers are overwhelmingly looking for transferable skills and then really good quality technical skills. And I think those transferable skills need to move upstream. Uh, that needs to be one of the responsibilities of, of school as well to include those. Uh, school shouldn't just be about GCSE certificates. Uh, that is a 19th century perspective on education. Uh, it should be about in- increasing young people's uh, teamwork, problem solving, communication, and giving them a taste of technical education earlier than 16 so they can make a really informed choice. Um, so we'd, we'd love to see that kind of moving a bit further up. Maybe even as in other jurisdictions, as Neil will well know, um, talking about that as general education rather than academic education, because it's something that actually everyone should have um, rather than saying academic and then making academic the kind of uh, the default to continue. Um, I think it's absolutely clear that employers have to have a key role here. And uh, Jennifer and the team at IFATE are doing a great job of involving them in standards development, in T-levels, making them feel uh, kind of loved and involved, which is really, really important. But I think it's also really clear from every- what everyone's saying that we we balance that. And I think we can balance it in a number of different ways. There's a really great 
example just from north of the border in Scotland of kind of trying to balance some of the, the kind of uh, employer and provider needs. So looking at things like development of graduate apprenticeships there as, as much more of a partnership um, between those two. Um, I think some people have touched on this already, but really trying to focus on bringing smaller businesses in. I know it's really hard. I know they're very time poor, but I think um, they can feel very alienated from the system if the standards are you know, 90% designed by big businesses uh, when you know, 90% of the businesses are, are smaller. Um, I think it's a really interesting feature of other European nations uh, that they see this just as a natural tripartite partnership between government, employers and trade unions. Uh, we almost never talk about the latter. And I know we don't have quite the same trade union movement here, but what that is a proxy for is what we're talking about here. It's about community. It's about the individuals um, and they don't focus. They don't feature naturally in that kind of triangle here. So I think that's a good thing, a good way for us to kind of think about that. Um, and I guess final thing just for me, because I know we want to get into the debate, but um, we would love to see kind of us think again and, and a bit more deep, deeply about regions and localities. Uh, we talk a lot about place based. There's a lot of enthusiasm out there from, uh, from from the mayoral authorities, from the combined authorities to get involved here. We absolutely need kind of national standards. Um, so I'm not suggesting that the IPH should kind of have uh, responsibility for different plumbers in, in Northampton and, and Newcastle. That definitely wouldn't work. But just thinking about some of the, the responsibility for drumming up demand, making it work locally. Um, I think there's there's more that we could do to shift some of the balance there, um, because I think some of the most powerful messages come from from that local level. Uh, brilliant, Ollie. Thank you very much. Um, we're just going to wrap up now uh, with the opening gambits by getting um, Diamond, um, who has just joined us, to give um, to give us their thoughts. Diamond, if you are um, if you're able to, can you just switch on your mic, switch on your um, your camera uh, we're just talking about the skill system overall is it too employer led could it be more learner led is the balance right can you give us a couple of minutes of your opening thoughts yes i can can you see me can you hear me you. hi there diamond hi yeah so i think that in terms of the skill set that is being portrayed now i feel like there is a, a massive balance that can be struck right now i feel like the employers are the ones that are sent, setting the mandate for the skills that are required, which makes total sense because at the end of the day, the students or the applicants are coming into their working culture and so have to adapt to their practices so that it's completely fair. However, one thing I come to recognize is because if every company sets a different set of skills, then the education system can't accommodate and prepare the, the students or the applicants accordingly and so what happens and I believe that's what's happening now is that you get highly educated students in academic subjects but very very shortly skilled in soft skills and the main skills that are actually need to be able to put these um, working knowledge into practice in the working space and that's why we've seen um, a massive gap in terms of employment not just because the job industry is quite difficult as a result of COVID and other issues but also the fact that we have incredibly knowledgeable candidates who are not able to apply these things properly um, and it makes um, cultivating work cultures very difficult. Um, one thing I've also learned is that in terms of facilitating this, the best practice that can be put in is to actually recognise what are the generic skills that are needed to actually make working functions easy within the workplace, simple things like organisation, minute taking, and um, the ability to facilitate a meeting, simple things like that can actually be put into practice. And I think over the years, it has been, they have made attempts to try and integrate this into the education system or into working practice or training. Um, but what has happened also is that the standard of that has slipped. So what I mean by that is that, for example, if they say, okay, we want to implement the idea of minute taking or being able to facilitate a workshop or a space, the standard of, of, of that that has been required is quite low. So people will get away with maybe making uh, short shorthand notes or secondhand writing. And when it comes to actually capturing the key elements of that meeting or what did users take away from when you facilitated that meeting, they're not able to capture it. So it just kind of works against the system that they're trying to create. So I personally believe that that's why it's a balance of both. If the working environments can let us know what skills generically and at what standard they require, then it can be facilitated on a more generic level within the different academic institutions, rather than just on a bespoke basis, which doesn't allow any entry points for any students, if that makes sense. 
it does make sense, Diamond. Thank you very much. Lots of nods around the panel then from um, your contribution. So um, thank you very much for that. Um, so that's all of the opening remarks now done. So um, let's um, start the discussion. So to, to kick things off, I wanted to come back to um, this leveling up point, which um, I think Jennifer first raised. But one of the be interesting to see who, who wants to come in on this first. Um, one of the targets that the leveling up targets that the government set themselves was to um, get 200,000 more people completing completing training annually um, by 2030, um, which sounds like a lot. But when you look at the gap between, when you look at the fall in the decline and the decline in, in participation over the last 10 years, it only really scratches the surface in terms of making some of those numbers back. But in terms of who should be part of that 200,000 and where are we going to get them from and how are we going, how are we going to get them into the system? I wonder who has um, who has some thoughts about getting um, getting those getting those people through the door. Um, Stephen, your hand shot up just then, so um, you can go first. Great, thanks, Shane. Yeah, I mean, I, my hand shot up because we we did a bit of analysis when that target was um, set, which showed that that would reverse. I think it was one quarter of the falls in learner numbers that we've seen since um, 2010. And I think uh, the 80,000 of those are meant to be in more deprived or lower skilled or more deprived areas or something. Um, and I think the NAO report shows that um, wouldn't quite uh, touch the site and the declines we've seen in those areas in the last 10 years or so. So I just feel like we're sort of for all the highfalutin rhetoric about world leading this, world leading that, it was, it's just woefully unambitious, really. So we are mid ranking in the OECD on in terms of our qualifications profile. We have been for about 40 years um, plus. The data doesn't go back far, far enough to tell us. Um, there's various sort of complaints about um, this stuff going back to Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations for anyone who's uh, who's interested in a longer time series. Um, and um, our analysis at the Learning and Work Institute shows that um, on current trends, we're going to flatline for the next decade or so, whereas other countries continue to improve. And so we're going backwards from a low base. So we need to do far, far better than these targets that have been set out. And to do that, you need some more money from government. Um, so our analysis shows that um, um, on its original plans, uh, adult skills funding in England would be 750 million lower in 24, 25 than it was in 2010, and higher inflation than expected takes that to a billion pounds. And then, as I say, employer investment is um, half the EU average per person um, and has fallen by 28 percent since 2005. So these are a set of very depressing statistics. Um, but they say we've got to do better. We've got to set higher ambition. Last point, where are they going to come from? Where are the learners going to come from? Um, I would say a focus on groups and areas that have missed out before is where we should be looking. And I'm going to particularly go on my hobby horse about literacy, numeracy, digital and other essential skills where one in five adults lack those skills and 63 percent fewer adults are taking those courses um, over the last uh, decade. This is disastrous for productivity. It's disastrous for leveling up. It's disastrous for any anything you want to name, really. And yet uh, the, the government has kind of forgotten, not forgotten about it, really, actually, and yeah, not promoted it sufficiently, not built it into other stuff. We've been trying to do some of that through Skills for Life Alliance, where we've pulled together uh, lots of partners. But I'd really like to see a focus on that and a much higher ambition for skills and learning in this country. Thank you, Stephen. Um, David, I'll come to you next. We just had a new skills minister appointed this week. Um, so, uh, we, I mean, we may, we may now we may also have another one um, in a few weeks' time with the new prime minister and a new cabinet. But if you were um, to go and see um, Andrew Jenkins, the new skills FE and HE minister, what would what would your advice be around get hitting that two hundred thousand new learners target? Uh, so it b builds on a point that Ollie alluded to in his opening uh, address, Shane, and, and this is about opportunities for younger people to engage in vocational and technical learning, and maybe in a way that is, you know, at very young ages, that may be through play, or it may be through, you know, all sorts of uh, enrichment type activity that sits around a, a curriculum. And the reason that I say that is because the evidence shows that actually that is absolutely crucial for inspiration, for aspiration, and actually, frankly, hope, particularly for people who are in the most disadvantaged groups or from the most disadvantaged backgrounds, where they can see that actually there are opportunities to, to, to get on into uh, technical and vocational careers. 
Um, and, and also there's, there's a, a, another, I suppose, beautiful aspect to that. that there's evidence that tells us that the earlier that people are exposed to the opportunity to develop technical and vocational skills, the more likely they are to reach a level of excellence if they continue to proceed with that or over, you know, over a career, over a lifetime. Uh, and we've got a massive productivity problem in this country. And so why, why would we not want people having opportunities to access technical and vocational skills to get to a level of excellence or mastery, which will help to boost productivity? Do you know, it just seems like a, a really obvious thing to do, albeit I accept that it's difficult to fit vocational and technical into curriculum at an earlier age, given on how jam-packed that, that is today. So I, we think that is crucially important, and we think there's evidence that backs up that argument. What, one of the other key things, I think, is, is to, to get that 200,000, and this is what Stephen started to allude to. We've got to go fishing in, in ponds where, where, where we've not previously, and to do that, we've got to have role models that are truly representative of all people from all parts of society that can encourage people and inspire people because they can see people that look like them that have been successful in a given occupation, in a given sector. Do you know they've got to a level of excellence? They've got to a level of you know seniority, and that maybe could be the you know the the, the spark that you know ignites somebody's uh, future uh, aspirations around learning and career. David, thank you. Um, I'll move, Neil, I'll come to you in a second. Um, Ollie, you say you've got a uplifting example of the, a pre-16 um, work-related learning model. Do you want to tell us yeah, about Yeah, of course. I think David's spot on. And, and it is hard for schools in the current um, system with things like EBAC and Progress 8, but it's not impossible. So I wanted to just give a bit of hope. So I went down to visit Cows Enterprise College uh, in the Isle of Wight uh, a few weeks ago, a school that we've been working with to develop the Maritime Futures curriculum. So they're a, they're a state school. They're, they're don't get any more money than anyone else. They have to do GCSEs and, and be inspected by Ofsted. But they spend five or six lessons uh, a week for every student all through uh, focused on the maritime industry. And they draw elements from different parts of the curriculum. So the kids will be building boats uh, and learning about the forces on them, which will bring in kind of science and design and technology, giving them that, that opportunity to think about kind of careers in that space. They'll be going on visits to marine employers, understanding that it's so much more than just shipbuilding. It's uh, navigation. It's, it's, it's tourism. It's all of those kind of different careers. Um, and they bring in things like uh, imperial history, uh, looking at explorers through kind of history, geography, the, the kind of biology on the seashore. So it is possible. It's hard, but it is possible. And when it happens, it just sets those kids' eyes on fire, thinking, actually, I'm not just learning geography to pass the exam. I'm learning geography because it fits into this and it might get me the kind of next step on the career and hopefully go and do one of Jennifer's great T-levels or apprenticeships. Nice. Cheers, Ali. Thanks for bringing that in. Um, Neil, one of the, lots of the countries that you mentioned earlier um, are higher up and perform better than, um, than, the, than the UK does on, on, on productivity specifically. Mm -hmm. um, so is, is that because, in your view, they have that mm -hmm. re relentless focus in their skill systems on, um, on the economy and jobs, jobs, jobs? And if that's the case, how do they solve some of the, um, how do they solve some of the social problems that Stephen mentioned that we also need a strong adult education system to help us solve? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the the question here is Stephen's here level of ambition, I think, in your question about the target and your allusion to what would you say to the minister? Uh, is that what I would say is, you know, again, talk to the Department for International Trade, first of all, and see where inward investment is coming into the country to create jobs, because that's really the point of the training target. It is where are the jobs going to be and what sort of jobs are they going to be so that we can you know, skill people up for those jobs, those future skills. Um, whether we know inward investors are interested in, you know, clean tech skills and digital skills and others, and they're coming to the UK to invest and create those jobs. But if the skill system and delivery isn't joined up to those, for example, if there's going to be a gigafactory for electric vehicles in the Northeast, skill system, I don't just mean it's colleges, training providers, institutes, technology, HE as well, you know, all geared up to deliver those skills applied. We won't land those deals, we won't land that investment. And so that's what, um, you know, I think that's the level of the challenge and that join up. And that's what we see other countries doing really well. You know, they are more productive. They are more economically savvy because they've, they've got an economic strategy which says, you know, we want to attract this sort of investment. We want to create these sorts of jobs for the long term. And we and our skill system is going to be joined up to deliver to those. And so that's really where this economic focus comes in and what we see other countries doing 
really much better um, than we are able to do in the UK. I mean, it's not all hope is not lost. I mean, Northern Ireland, you know, it's a smaller system and a smaller economy, does this really well and already has quite a joined up system to deliver to inward investor needs. Um, and, you know, but we think that that sort of model could be transposed across to different regions in England, for example, in terms of scale and size. And so, you know, that there are things we can do, I think, to make sure that the the leveling up agenda and the targets are really linked into economic development. Um, I think to your point, Shane, around, you know, it's all about jobs, jobs, jobs. You know, I do think some of the countries in the Far East are, you know, very um, economically focused and you do see, you know, mental health problems in young people and other learners and through the education system. But what they are doing is learning from us in the UK. And they're actually looking to us to see how do we create, how do we put more creativity into their curriculum based on the creativity we, they see in the UK. So I think there's more of a two-way dialogue than perhaps you know, people recognise that, um, and you know, as I said at the beginning, you've got to get the, your question, you've got to get the balance right. But I think at the minute, um, you know, we are not sufficiently focused on linking up training and opportunities for jobs and inward investment to make sure we're giving you know people hope that by doing the training there's going to be a great job at the end of it um and a long-term job and you know highly paid job so um i think that's the the challenge would be the, the leveling up um agenda in terms of education and training and if we can get ministers talking to each other in different departments around our economic development and the leveling up and skill strategy should all work together i think that would be a major step forward Neil, thank you very much. That was really, really insightful. Um, Robert, we'll come to you next. Um, one of the things that Stephen said that I thought was quite interesting um, was around the need to focus more at the, the lower end of the of the of the skills landscape. So um, having a specific emphasis on the one in five working age adults in this country who lack basic skills. Um, surely employers stand to benefit from a sort of a leveling up. Um, I hate myself for saying that. Uh, a leveling up of um the workforce's basic skills just as much as in that level four five space and above so why is it that we see so much in your view why is it that we see so much coming from leps skills advisory panels and all of the sort of skill strategies that are led by employers why is it that so much of that focuses at the top end and not at the bottom end do you think um i think it's because that tends to be where the steer comes in so again back to my original point about how much is it actually uh, directed at employers or actually responsive to these employers because employers need all of those skills levels as I said at the opening you know employers cover level twos to level seven so they all they all need that I think an interesting uh, point when you talked about where the new learners are coming from is no new learners doesn't always mean young learners I think the biggest game in town at the moment is the need for reskilling and in work training and as you know, Steve was talking about the strong ed adult education system, you know, that that's a particular area now. And we've seen some move towards it with, you know, with the whole idea around lifelong learning. But are we really doing the kind of things that, that people need? So often at that lower end, actually what you need is more modular short courses to be available. Now, are those things available or are you asking someone who's in their 50s who needs to be reskilled to a particular job to do an apprenticeship? Which is nothing about whether, you know, going back on apprenticeship per se, but what we need is apprenticeships plus. Actually, what we need is a broader range of options on a broader uh, range of length of time. But it does it needs to focus on, the for me, the main game in town, which is there is an urgent need at the moment to reskill. Uh, at all levels, and there's an urgent need to consider and remember that new learners also include people who are uh, and have been in work for some time. Robert, thank you. Um, Simon, you've got you had your hand up very patiently for um, for a, a long time. Um, as somebody that was involved in a local skills improvement plan trailblazer. Um, I read all the trailblazers and there's a there's a piece of analysis on FU Week about the first um about the first tranche of trailblazer LSIPs. They pretty much all said what Roberts just said about that demand from employers for shorter, more modular um uh, qualifications, courses, accredited, non-accredited within the skill system to give employers that level of choice. Do you think we've like is that is that remotely deliverable in this sort of highly highly regulated marketplace that we've got or do you think something massive needs to change for that to happen 
It's interesting, wasn't it? Because certainly at uh, high level skills with the, you know, looking at the lifelong lo learning entitlements, you know, it is about flexibility uh, and modular. Uh, then you look at uh, kind of lower levels and level two and below review, and it's about full fat, larger qualifications. So we have a bit of a sort of disjoint, I guess, between sort of younger people need more substantial training and kind of older uh, adults will have, seem to have more flexibility. So there seems to be a sort of different sort of policy between sort of th those two conundrums based on level as well. So, uh, I mean, we think sort of flexible and, and modular learning has a role at all levels, at all ages. Um, I mean, the thing on, on flexible programmes, uh, absolutely, I think, as colleagues have mentioned, you know, the, the friendship isn't the be all and end all. But, you know, we have got skilled boot camps, you know, they're, 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 they're really good, flexible programmes for un unemployed and, and uh, employed adults. I mean, there's also talk about pre-apprenticeships. We've got traineeships. You know, that's a fantastic program with some fa fantastic successes. You know, going back to the the NEO report, you know, the the skill system is, is very fragmented and confusing. I don't know why we need to kind of keep re re replicating um, uh, and replacing things that uh, could could work and work work uh, already well. I mean, just going back going back to my you know my original uh, why I was going to originally raise a, raise a point about um, you know the two hundred thousand target. It uh, goes back to our, our, our vision, really, around moving to much more of a demand-led system. Uh, you know, the, the adult education budget has been underspent year and year on, under year under under year. Um, absolutely, we, as Stephen said, we've seen a massive decline in the amount of investment in in a, AEB. It's very difficult to go back to the treasury and ask for more money when we're not spending the money that we've got. So, if we move to a much more demand-led system, uh, we'd probably see uh, you know higher rates of participation. So, for me, that'd be a sort of uh, slightly quicker win in terms of you know trying to drive participation on those um, disadvantaged adults who haven't got a level two qualification or, or need those kind of core skills around maths and English. So thank you. Um, Jennifer, one of the, the NAO reports been mentioned a few times and it was it was fairly critical of um, the DFE's approach to the employer-led system. It says um, DFE is staking its success on a more employer-led system, but from the evidence we've seen, it's unclear whether the conditions are in place for this to be implemented successfully. What did what did that mean to you? How did you react when you saw that? Uh, Jennifer, you just need to unmute, and then we can hear you. There we go. Oh, sorry, I thought you were controlling me, Shane. Um, so. Um... Yeah, I mean, I fed into the NAO report. I fed contributed to the NAO report, and I think it was a pretty fair uh, assessment of, of of where we're at. I thought it was uh, actually really positive about um, the gains that we've made in the skill system through engaging with employers to the extent that we have, um, and I think they recognise that. Um, we have had significant positive changes as a result of doing that in terms of the level and, uh, of, of, of skills that we're gaining at different, pot, different uh, skill levels across the economy. I think it's a completely fair challenge. Uh, if I were the NAO, I would say the same thing um, about the sort of future need to really engage employers at all sorts of levels within the system and in all sorts of different ways. Um, and I think Robert was making the point really well earlier on about, um, you know, employers aren't a sort of homogenous group. You know, you've got some who are really, really keen to engage. And, I, you know, I see them on, on the daily. They are very happy to spend hours with my officials in IFA working in detail on, 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 a, on a particular uh, apprenticeship design because they feel so passionately about it. But the vast majority of employers aren't like that. The vast majority of employers are small businesses and they're trying to make a profit. They're trying to keep their employees employed. Um, but nonetheless, they want the system to work for them. So, you know, we have to do, um, sorry, my phone's going off. <laughs> we have to make sure that we're nuancing our approach and we're reflecting that uh, back to employers and making making it possible for employers of every kind of stripe to get what they need out of the system. Um, and I think just just going back on some of the, the earlier kind of conversation that we were having, I think um, uh, Stephen was making the point very well about the need for investing in skills at the, the, the lower end. And I think we're in a really important sort of pivot point, I guess, in the economy. It's such an interesting time in the economy that we've got these you know, huge numbers of vacancies, huge num huge amount of kind of skill shortages, and yet we've got growing numbers of young people need. And we've got lots of really 
good bits of intervention. So, you know, we have got traineeships, you know, we've got boot camps, we've got fabulous apprenticeships, we've got new T levels coming on stream. I think we've got a bit of a gap in the kind of adult skill space that, that you know, in terms of drawing more adults back into training to upskill uh, and, and, and retrain. Um, but w- what we haven't quite got yet is a thoroughgoing kind of delivery plan to make all that kind of come together and I think this is what Neil is talking about how do you glue it together so that you've got um that demand being met by the supply side um and uh, in a in a in a way that kind of gives people the skills the skills that the economy the skills that the economy needs and make sure that we don't have a situation where advantages just keep going to people who've already got advantages Jennifer, thank you. Um, We do have a um, small amount of time left. And um, Diamond, if you're still with us, I did want to bring you in um, at this point just to see if you had um, any any responses to any of the points you've you've just that that have just been made. And I can't see you on screen, so I'm not sure if you're still there or not. Ah, there you are. Hi, Diamond. one of the lot, quite a lot, quite, there's been quite a lot that's been talked about. But um, with with you and your work with you know students and young people. particularly around the points that like Ollie and others have made about changes that we can make before people leave school to make them like I guess more hungry for learning later in life so they see learning as a journey that they go through throughout their working lives not something that just stops at 16 or 18 or or 21 what changes do you think need to happen to 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 create that sort of environment I love this question thank you so much for asking me um I feel like the major changes that need to be made um, but probably this might sound pessimistic, but it might be a bit too big for scope in terms of reformation of the education system. But in turn, I feel like the biggest impact that can be made is actually facilitating the learning that they want. Now, this may sound contradictory because it's like at the end of the day, there's a certain standard of education that should generically be provided for every student. But when a child is, is given education that they are excited to learn about, it then entices them to learn more. So for example, what's, what I've seen over the years as I've been in education is as they've made more restricting policies in terms of the GCSEs that students have to take and stuff like that, you've seen a, a very sharp decline in the zeal that students have. So when I was in school, which wasn't even that long ago, there was more liberty to choose the different options that you wanted. And as a result, you were excited to get up in the morning, you were excited to go to the classes. Sometimes there was that fear or anxiety of I missed this lesson for another opportunity or something that was enrichment based, how would it fare? But as a result of having more strict things in terms of you have to do a language, you have to do um, like a geography or history or some or a social kind of um, GCSE, it's now kind of boxed and made a lot of students feel restricted. And as a result, later on in life, if something is made compulsory, the same attitude they had within the education system is actually they're going to apply. So if you tell them in their workplace that they need, they have to do mandatory training for, I don't know, to learn about a work management tool or anything like that, the same mindset that they applied when they had to have mandatory subjects is what the same kind of energy you will get when they are applying it to other working functions. So I feel like that's one major thing that can be done. A more practical thing that I think could be applied is actually teaching students or anybody that is undergoing education, the need and the importance of what it is. I feel like that gap is really majorly left open. A lot of students, and even actually funnily enough, some students said that to me this week, they're like, Miss, what's the point? I don't, why are we doing this, what's the point? And if they're just simply taught, okay, look, you think that math is not helpful, but in the long run, this is, this is how it will help you. Or when you're calculating budgets for yourself, this and this and this will help you. Then they begin to actually recognize, oh, actually, I do need maths. Oh, I do need um, sociology. Or I do need actually to be able to negotiate. I need to learn how to do these things. The basin is not just so I can argue and say my point. Um, and so I've actually been trying to be more intentional with the sessions that I facilitate with my students and letting them know, okay, look, This is actually the purpose of this. You need to know about finances because when you get to uni, if you don't manage yourself well, you're going to be broke. So things like this have triggered a lot of thought. And actually, a lot of the students now have been more inspired to take on work experience and stuff, which has made me so appreciative and obviously feeling like I make a difference. So gave me a bit of a long term and a short term there. Hope that's Mm. still helpful. 
No, Diamond, thank you. That's a really great example about the sort of way that you sort of like functionalize and make real what you teach in the classroom to sort of instill that love of learning in young people, which will hopefully, you know, transcends all stages of their education journey and for the rest of their lives. So um, they're, they're really lucky to have you, Diamond. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we are um, rapidly running out of time. And the, the last word um, this afternoon is going to go to um, David Gallagher to sort of sum things up for us. David, do you think we're any closer to answering our key question today? Um, I'm not sure if we're any closer to answering the questions in, in full, uh, but I certainly think we're asking the right questions and we've got some of the, you know, the, the, the brain power that's needed uh, to, to get to where we need to be. Uh, but, but this is a, an intergenerational game that I think that we're, we're playing and uh, a continuous improvement is, is definitely uh, how I think we should look at this. Uh, and almost impossible to sum up this session because of the richness, the breadth and the depth of the conversation and, and the experts around the tables. It, it's And it's certainly, you know, not 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 me that's got the expertise in, in much of what we've discussed. So there's just a few threads uh, that, that I was going to pull out or, or a few key points that I've scribbled and I've, I've almost filled a book <laughs> in the last hour. Uh, the first one is around, Neil mentioned this, this almost false dichotomy of are we learners or should we be learner-centred or should we be employer-centred? And I think what I heard, and, I, and I'm using my own words for this, is we should be centred on needs and prosperity-led. Prosperity led for individuals, for local communities, but also, you know, for, for the economy and society as a whole. So need centered and prosperity led is, is what, what I took away rather than this false dichotomy of learners or employers. Um, the, the second uh, key takeaway for me was around this point that Ollie raised initially, getting into the curriculum earlier as a means of inspiring, uh, of, of providing hope and of providing, you know, the insight that's needed for, for young people to make great choices. Um, so, so, and, and a fantastic example there, and, and I'm sure you know we'd all love to hear more about that. Uh, the third point for me was around a cultural shift that may well still be needed, and I'm talking about a cultural shift from some employers and possibly some sectors where they need to possibly lean in uh, to, to the skill system more, to invest more, to get more out from uh, in terms of a return on investment. But the quid pro quo of that is that that as a as an education sector, and particularly those of us that are in technical and vocational, we need to to develop a system that is more agile and more responsive. We as providers in the system need to be more agile and responsive, and ultimately to ensure that our, our learners at all ages and stages are also more agile and responsive to to a rapidly changing world and and labour market. A uh, couple of key points around all ages and stages. You know, we're all drawn to talking about young people and for very good reasons. You know, it's highly emotive when we've got children and, and, and nephews and nieces. You know, it's, it's the thing that, that we're, we're, most of us are often drawn to. But we cannot forget that this is truly all about all ages and stages and all levels too. And sometimes those lower levels get forgotten. So let, let's not forget that. And then the final point, and this is a point that I would I would come to last of all, because it's something that I, I never stop talking about, is, is around this... Uh, argument for meta skills or essential skills, I think, is, is what we're landing on around things like problem solving, collaboration, critical thinking. Do you know, this is an example today of where we are doing this as, as leaders in the sector. We need to do this more as actors in a system. And we also need to deliver those skills uh, to, to, to all learners of all ages and stages to, to equip them for, for what the world throws at them. And, and so that came through uh, loud and clear in, in all sorts of uh, aspects of today's conversation. So I hope in, uh, that goes some way to, to you know, summing up uh, an incredibly rich and interesting conversation uh, yeah, that I, I don't feel I can possibly do justice to, but hopefully that uh, gives, gives a few final thoughts to, to linger on. Fantastic, David. Thank you very much. Um, that's all we've got time for. I hope that today's debate has stimulated some thoughts of your own. And if so, do let us know in the comments section. Um, a huge, huge thank you to today's amazing panel. And on that, we will see you next time.